Amen. Welcome to a wonderful Wednesday. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Hallelujah. Amen. I'm continuing my series of uh, Galatians. And um, we're going to look at Galatians chapter 1, verses 11 through 24 this evening. And um, I just want to give you a quick update on um, Jan. Jan's still in the hospital, and um, she would cover, covet your prayers. So if you have it in your mind to, to pray for Jan, that would be wonderful. And uh, hopefully uh, things will work out for her and uh, she'll be back with us soon. Yeah. This evening I am going to teach a message that you probably wouldn't think is in the Bible. But they had terrorists in the Bible. And tonight I want to talk about how a terrorist became an evangelist. Let us bow our heads and pray, and we'll get into this evening's message. Gracious Father, I thank you for this message. I thank you for this text. I ask, Lord, that you'd bless the word as it goes forth from your manservant. Help us with wisdom and understanding. Give us wisdom, Lord. Your brother James said, if any of us lacks wisdom, we're to ask of God, and you will give it to us abundantly and liberally. And so we anticipate that this evening. Settle our hearts and minds, Lord. Let us put aside the cares and the worries of this day. Let us focus for the next few moments on you. Give us that time, Lord, that we can study your word, hear your word, and then allow your word to take hold of us and transform us into the people that you would want us to be. Bless us even now as the word goes forth. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. If you have one of these little electronic devices turn it off oh, yeah. or put it on silent Amen. be respectful of other people Amen. if your phone goes off Amen. there's a fifty dollar fee that will be collected on the spot <laughs> so how does a terrorist become an evangelist i have to tell you this evening that christianity is supremely a religion of conversion Everything we say and everything we believe is built upon one fundamental and revolutionary promise. You don't have to stay the way you are. Amen. It's interesting because most people don't realize that about Christianity. Matter of fact, I had a spiritual father who said, I'm not where I want to be, but thank God I'm not the way I used to be. <laughs> I'm getting better day by day. See, your life can be radically changed by God. That's actually the essence of what the transformational power of the gospel is really all about. That your life, not just incrementally changed, but radically changed by God. And conversion is a miracle that happens when the life of God intersects with a human personality. And once God enters the picture, your life will never be the same again. And until then, you might be religious, and you might even be a real good person. And you might even be able to obey most of the rules of the church, or biblically. But the big issue is, this evening, have you been converted? See, religion is one thing, and conversion is something entirely different. It's the conviction that long-held prejudices can be overcome, lifelong habits can be broken, deeply ingrained patterns of sin can be erased over time. Conversion is the certainty that what you were does not determine what you are. See, what you are does not determine what you will be. See, you can be changed, you can be different, and your life can move into an entirely new direction with the power of this gospel. Amen. See, Amen. if you take that truth away from Christianity, actually Christianity would cease to be a supernatural religion. If the possibility of real change is gone, then we're nothing left with nothing left but just a set of rules. Anybody can have rules, but can a leopard change his spots in himself and by himself? 
The leopard can never change his spots. But with God, all things are possible. You see, I'm going to tell you this evening the greatest conversion story in the entire Bible. Of all the conversion stories in the Bible, there's no conversion story that is greater and more profound than the conversion of a man called Saul of Tarsus. He was raised a Jew, trained as a rabbi. He became a violent persecutor of the early Christian church. He hated Christ. And even more than that, he hated the followers of Christ so much that he did his best to eradicate this new religion as if it was some sort of dreaded virus. He was a terrorist. He might have been one of the first terrorists, or not the original terrorists, but he was certainly a terrorist who did evil things in the name of God. Not only just in the name of a generic God, he did evil deeds in the name of the God of the Bible. And then one day, he met Jesus. And his life was never the same. You see that one day when Paul, formerly Saul, had met Jesus, his life was permanently transformed. So bad was Saul's reputation that at first no one believed that this change was even real. Word began to spread quickly that Saul the persecutor had become Saul the Christian. And he had come over to Christ. And over time, he proved to be genuine in his faith and his walk with Jesus. What happened to him made such an impact that the New Testament contains three separate dramatic accounts of his conversion. The first is in Acts chapter 9. The second is in Acts chapter 26. And the third is in the text that we're covering this evening Galatians chapter 1. Paul's story begins with a statement about the source of his gospel preaching. Evidently, the Judaizers, those Jewish Christian converts who claimed to represent the apostles in Jerusalem, they were attacking his apostleship and his message. In essence, they claimed that his message wasn't true and he himself could not be trusted based on his history, his past. And that raises an interesting question. How do you prove that you're trustworthy? There's an answer to that question. You tell your story and let your story speak for itself. That's where Paul starts his defense in Galatians chapter 1, verses 11 and 12. He said, I want you to know, brothers, that the gospel I preach is not something that man made up. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. These verses emphasize two important truths that we need to grasp this evening. First, the gospel was not Paul's idea. The gospel is God's idea. And second, because the gospel comes from God, The gospel must be true. See, Paul is merely the conduit for that truth. He's not the source of that truth. See, Christianity does not spring forth from legends or vague dreams. It's not the result of scholarly argument nor a compromise that was arrived at by some ancient church council. The gospel message is truly good news because the gospel message is God's good news. See, with that established, Paul then and now proceeds to tell his own story. And if you go to an evangelism class, you'll be taught to use this three-point outline in giving your testimony. Point one, you speak of your life before conversion. Point two, you speak of how you came to Christ. And point three, you speak of your life since coming to Christ. And that's precisely the outline that Paul uses in the text that we're going to speak of this evening. When I come to the end of the sermon, I'm going to close this message, and I'm going to give you the two sentences now, 
and ask you to think about them while I preach this message. Usually I don't give you what the ending is, but tonight I'm going to do that. And here it is. You cannot understand Christianity without coming to grips with the truth about conversion. And the second question is this. Have you ever been converted? First, I want to speak about Paul's life before conversion. This is found in verses 13 and 14 in Galatians chapter 1. And the text reads as follows, For you have heard my previous way of life in Judaism, how intensely I persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it. I was advancing in Judaism beyond many Jews of my own age and was extremely zealous for the traditions of my fathers. These verses tell a chilling story. Before Paul came to Christ, his name was Saul, and he was perfectly happy in his career as a rising Jewish leader. He was an avid Christian hater. He felt no remorse over his persecution of the followers of Christ. In fact, he regarded it as his service to God himself. He had no desire to come to Christ, and he felt no need for Christ in his own heart. His religion satisfied him in every single way, and he saw no need for anything else. He was like those people who respond to, I found it! That was a campaign by Campus Crusade for Christ by promoting their own version of, I never lost it. Was Paul interested in becoming a Christian? Let me tell you, how many ways can I say no? He had no interest in Christianity. He wasn't looking for Christ. But the interesting thing is this. Christ was looking for him. Only could God save a man like Paul. And it turns out that's exactly what God has done. In Acts 8, Verses 1 through 3, it tells us that Saul, Paul's pre-conversion name, he went from house to house with a sort of reverse evangelism. See, back then, they had this knock-knock game. Saul knocked on doors. Knock-knock! Any Christians here? And if the answer was yes, he dragged them out of their homes and he put them in prison. His heart was full of murderous rage. Anyone who claimed to be a follower of Jesus of Nazareth was sent to prison or even worse. He was breathing threats against the Lord's disciples. And when he was on his way to Damascus to root out the fledgling Christian movement in that great city, as told in Acts chapter 9, verses 1 or 2, he approved of the stoning of Stephen. And when the other Christians were put to death, he cast his vote against them. In his mind, the best way to defeat Christianity was just simply to kill all the Christians. In his zeal, he had no peer, he had no equal. Either as a student of the law of Moses or as a fierce opponent of the church of God. He was a religious fanatic. He was a bigot, a zealot, a man who only had given over to his hatred of Christians. He would stop at nothing to prevent his new movement from spreading. Paul tells a story this way because he wants us to understand that he wasn't like one who we would call a seeker. No, he had no interest in Jesus. He wasn't seeking anything except more Christians to throw in prison or more Christians to put to death. He had no sense of his need for salvation. He had no inner voice that called him to come to Christ. It would be hard to imagine a more hopeless case than Saul who would become Paul. Why bother praying for a man like this, one who didn't even see any need for Christ at all? He'll never be saved, or so it would seem. He was totally convinced he was right. You know people like that. They're totally wrong, but they're totally convinced 
They're right. Mm -hmm. He was totally convinced that the Christians were wrong. He hated Christianity and he loved Judaism. He was lost and he didn't even know it. I'm sure you know people like that. Mm -hmm. He enjoyed his life and he wasn't looking for something better. And I know you know people like that. We can sum it up by saying he was on a collision course with eternal judgment. What he desperately needed, but would never admit, was a strong dose of divine intervention. Paul paints this picture black, so brilliant that bright light of the gospel can clearly be seen here. Not everyone has a story like Paul's, but many do. I know many men who have gone so far in sin that when they come to Christ, their testimony goes something like this. You think I was a bad guy. You don't know the half of it. I was a lousy bum. Then the Lord found me and cleaned me up. There is no way to account for my life apart from God's simple, amazing grace. There's people in this church like that. Amen. People that, if you knew their past, you might think twice about even being with them. We have people who have spent time in prison. We have people that have been involved in all sorts of immorality. We have young people that have been on drugs. Some still are struggling with that. People who've been in and out of jail, sometimes because of drugs. We have people that are thieves, adulterers. We even, I even know people who are former murderers. If you want to play that game, name that sin, <laughs> we've probably got some winners in every category. But harvest time isn't unique in that sense. See, every church could probably say the same thing if they're of any size and have a number of people. I often think it's a good thing that we don't know the naked truth about each other because if we did, we probably would say, I think I should go someplace else to church. It's kind of funny. I tell people sometimes and they think I'm a little goofy. Just tell me the naked truth. I can't handle the lie. I can handle the naked truth. But until we find out the truth, wow, you know, we'll just deal with those people. But there's all sorts of sinners who make up the body of Christ. That's a fact. They have in common that they've been washed in the blood. Washed in the blood of Jesus. Forgiven by Jesus. Justified by grace. Reconciled to God. Redeemed, restored, converted. And their lives have been radically changed. And this is as it should be. You wouldn't believe it if I told you, but I was as bad as you could be. And when I hit bottom, I looked up and found the Lord waiting Amen. for me. That's right. But let's talk about Paul's conversion. We'll look at verse 15 and the first part of verse 16. Paul goes on to write here in Galatians chapter 1, but when God, I should have put my one of my but God shirts on. I think I wore the wrong shirt today. <laughs> but when God, who set me apart from birth and called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me so that I might preach him amongst the Gentiles. Focus for a moment on that first word. One of my favorite words, actually two of my favorite words, but that first word, but. That three-letter word, this is a great interruption. Everything and then but. All that happened in Paul's life because of that one little word. Paul was a sinner, but God. Paul hated Jesus, but God. Paul tried to kill Christians, but God. Paul wanted to destroy the church, but God. Paul enjoyed being lost, but God. Paul wasn't looking for a new life, 
but God. Paul intended to kill more Christians, but God. Note the change in subjects. When Paul talks about his former life, it was always I, 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 I. Totally tell self-absorbed. But now when he talks about his conversion, the focus completely changes. Now it is God's who moves into action. I have a friend of mine who points out that God came into Paul's life without his permission. See, Paul, Paul or Saul, he didn't wait to be asked. See, while Saul was on that road to Damascus, the Lord just barged right in. He didn't have permission. He didn't ask permission because if he had asked, Saul would have said a straight, flat-out no. See, he came in where he wasn't wanted or expected, and he took over the situation. That's God. Notice why he did it. It says in our text that God was pleased to reveal His Son in me. God didn't have permission to do that. He came in because He wanted to come in. He chose to come in. He entered without ringing the doorbell. Don't you hate that? You come over, you, didn't, you weren't even asked to come over. But that's what Jesus did to Saul. He was just riding riding on his donkey down the road, trying to go look for some more Christians to, to, to fuss with and kill and throw in prison. But God... See, this is called pure, sovereign, saving grace. And you might say, that's not fair. You know, do you realize that Paul would never say that? See, if God had waited for an inv invitation... Paul would never have been saved, ever. He was just lost, just like Lazarus was just dead. Did you hear what I just said? See, Saul was lost just like Lazarus was dead. You're like, whoa, 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 whoa. I don't understand. See, it's not as if Lazarus was sitting in the tomb saying, I wish somebody would come here and raise me from the dead. <laughs> See, he was stinking stone cold dead. I said, stinking stone cold dead. Lazarus wasn't thinking, laying there in that tomb thinking, I wish somebody would come and speak life into me. See, no, he's dead. And then Jesus came along and Jesus raised Lazarus without his permission. Let us learn from this that salvation begins with God and not with us. See, salvation is of the Lord. There's another remarkable statement here that I want you to grasp. Paul says that God called him from his mother's womb. I mean, this is a guy that was out killing Christians. Now he's saying, whoa, 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 whoa. God had called me way back then, in my mother's womb. That means that God was tracking him down from the beginning of his life. God has had his eye on Paul while he was still in the womb, while he was a toddler. God was watching his every step during his rambunctious teenage puberty years. God kept his sights on him. During the long years of his rabbinical training, God was calling him to salvation, although he thought he was being trained as a rabbi. I mean, imagine this. Paul didn't know it. Paul didn't feel it. Paul was totally unaware of it. And in fact, he couldn't see it at all until after he came to Christ. See, then he looks back and he sees God's fingerprints in every part of his life from the time he was in his mother's womb. See, that's the hound of heaven. The hound of heaven was on his trail 
And when the time had fully come, yes. God reached down, mm -hmm. yes. slapped him down on that Damascus road, yes. and brought him into the kingdom yes. without his permission. Yes. His whole life had been planned by God for just that moment. Nothing had happened by accident. All of this was ordained as part of God's divine plan. Yes. But does this not destroy the concept of free will? No. You know, you might say, well, wait a minute, we're supposed to have free will. This doesn't destroy that concept at all. I believe that God gives us choices to make. And then he holds us accountable for those choices. Like the song says, he doesn't make us go against our will. He just makes us willing to go. Amen. See, God brought Paul to a place where he had no other choice but to freely choose Jesus Christ. See, when God calls a man like this, he responds, he comes, he obeys. God will have it no other way. See, God overcomes our reluctance. Because a lot of us, we have a reluctance before Christ. He knocks down all of our excuses. And don't look at me like that. I know a lot of you have excuses. But slowly but surely, God draws us to His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. When we aren't aware of it, from our side, we think we're accepting Christ, we're believing on Christ, or we're trusting in Christ as our Savior. Sometimes we say, I found the Lord. That might be a little true, but remember as I preached from this pulpit before, if the Lord didn't find you first, you would have never found Him at all. And in the end, God gets all the glory for our salvation. That is certainly how Paul felt as he looked back on his own amazing conversion. The next point that I want to preach on this evening is from verses 16, the second part of 16 through 24, Paul's life after conversion. And the text reads as follows, I did not consult any man, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to see those who were apostles before I was. But I went immediately into Arabia and later turned to Damascus, then, after three years, you know something else that happened in three years. I went up to Jerusalem to get acquainted with Peter and stayed with him 15 days. I saw none of the other apostles, only James, the Lord's brother. I assure you before God that what I was writing you is no lie. Later I went to Syria and Cecilia. I was personally unknown to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. They only heard the report. The man who formerly persecuted us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy. And they praised God because of me. Interesting text, but Paul's emphasis in these verses is on what he didn't do. He didn't immediately go to Jerusalem to be trained by the apostles. He didn't start some kind of evangelistic ministry right away. What did he do? He dropped out of sight for three years by going to Arabia. See, we probably would have said, put him on Christian broadcasting. Put him on a Christian radio station or CBN or whatever. You know, put him on all the Christian radio and TV programs. We would have had said, you know, Paul, Paul you need to write a book and hit the Christian talk show circuit and sell a lot of books, you'll get some money that way. But that wasn't God's plan. God sent him to Arabia, and he spent three years in Arabia, evidently in personal study and meditation. He went back to Damascus, where he was originally headed, where he wanted to kill the Christians. He met up for a brief time on a brief trip to Jerusalem to meet up with the Apostle Peter, then he went north to Syria and Cecilia to preach the gospel. In all of this, we see three new attitudes emerging. A new attitude towards other believers. He went to Jerusalem to meet with the Apostle Peter. We see a new attitude towards truth. He declares in verse 20 that he's not lying. So apparently in his previous life, 
He was a liar. <laughs> and we see, you know that, that's one of the things that drives me nuts. You know, lying. You know, some people mix a little truth with a lie and they think it's a whole truth. A half truth is a full lie. You know, stop lying. And then, yeah. if that doesn't scare you enough, I'll just go on a little bunny trail here. Amen. Amen. Look to Revelation chapter 21. It says all liars go to hell, but don't let that bother you too much. <laughs> but back to this story. He had a new attitude towards the gospel. He now preaches what he once tried to destroy. See, once he hated believers... Now he wants to seek their fellowship. He once hated the truth of the gospel. Now he lives by that very truth. He once hated the gospel. Now he preaches the gospel. He once was called Saul. Now he's called Paul. Same man, new man. Everything is different now. Once he was a terrorist. Now he's an evangelist. See, what happened? Christ has made all the difference. Amen. The passage ends on a wonderful note that, as Paul says, that the churches in Judea, which were once terrorized in his pre-conversion days, recognize the amazing change in his life. And they glorify God because of him. Yeah. His life pointed towards people who were pointed towards God. That leads me to a simple and profound question. Is anyone glorifying God yes. because of you? Yes. Did you understand what I just said? Do you know anyone who's glorifying God because of you? Is your life pointing people towards God? See, because your life is either pointing people towards God or you're taking them in the other direction. You can't point them in both directions. See, some of you think you're smooth. Maybe a little too smooth. But I gotta tell you, you're either pointing people to Christ or you're taking them to a different place. So I wanna give you some take home truths from this word that I really hope you understand and I really hope you grasp. I'll try to make it short and sweet. No, I won't. But as I wrap up this message, I think there's the need to focus on a few takeaways or take-homes that you really should understand. The first one's this. The Christian gospel comes from God, not from man. How many times when people talk about the Bible, they just say, ah, man's book. Man wrote that book. I don't care about it. Man's book. The gospel, the true Christian gospel, comes from God, not from man. This is hugely important, and it's an important point because we live in this pluralistic society that teaches us over and over and over and over and over again that all religions are just basically the same. I mean, even people with huge audiences, and I'm not picking on Oprah, but, you know, Oprah says, you can get to heaven any which way you want. There's many, many, many ways to heaven. That's not biblical. The Bible says, and it's on our sign, it's a little faded out there, it says that what Jesus said, John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, the life, and then it goes on to say, no man comes to the Father except through me. Amen. That's the fact. Amen. And if you think there's many ways, well, you got religion, you don't have Jesus. Amen. And you can think whatever you want. You have the free will to think and believe whatever you want. But Amen. all religions are not basically the same. Amen. You know, some people just think that we're all going to the same place. No. Uh, that's not true either. See, we're not all going to the same place. You know, if you want to look at some really good verses, read Matthew 6 and 7. Because Matthew 6 and 7, it says, Wide is the way, narrow is the path, few enter in. Well, the few enter in, that means most don't. 
If that doesn't make you nervous, then when you get into Matthew 7, it says, in that day, what day? That day, when the judgment day, it says, many will say, Lord, Lord, we did miracles in your name. We did great exploits in your name. And you know what he says? Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. So there's people that have a lot of religious hocus pocus. And he's going to say, bye bye. I never knew you. Because they never were truly converted. And they never followed the one true Christ. The only Christ. So those people that preach that all religions are the same. That's a big fat lie. Those people that teach that we're all going to the same place. That's a big fat lie. And you know... Some people just think that, you know, all religious systems are the same, you know. I mean, you you hear that nonsense now, um, you know, that there's no religious system that's different than other or superior than other other system. And this is, of course, nonsense. See, in our pluralistic world, we just think everything's the same. But it's not true. Even on the face of it, many people accept it that, This is the gospel truth, because they don't really know. They haven't studied the word, the scriptures themselves. But Paul's words in verses 11 and 12 point us here in the right direction. The gospel is not the result of polling data. The gospel is not the work of a church committee. The gospel is not like the game gossip, where one person whispers a sentence in the ear of another person, and that person person repeats what he heard and it goes around the circle until the last person repeats what he thought he heard and it bears no resemblance to the first statement that was spoken the gospel is not like that game gossip the gospel is based on the sober historical facts surrounding the life the death and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ amen that's the gospel Amen. The true and only gospel. Amen. You know, these things were not done in a corner by some secret little church committee. Yeah. Anyone can check them out at any time. The gospel is true because the gospel comes directly from God. Amen. The next point that I want to make, the next take home that I want you to leave here tonight with is this. Conversion is a pure miracle that depends on God alone. See, God takes responsibility for our salvation. He arranges a circumstance so that we can know him personally. We rarely see this coming in advance. But looking back, we can clearly see how God's hand was graciously drawing us to himself. Conversion is not a cooperative venture between God and man. Even the ability to believe in Christ is a gift of God. Thus, all the glory belongs to the Lord. Amen. Conversion is a pure miracle that depends on God alone. Amen. The third take home that I really want you to grab hold of this evening is this. The worst sinners often make the best saints. Oh. See, if you're truly a converted Christian, if you're truly a converted person, you're a saint. You don't have to have that bestowed by some uh, liturgical group or some denominational group. Saints don't come that way. Saints come by conversion from Almighty God. See, note that word often. See, I said the worst sinners often make the best saints. See, not Every sinner comes to Christ. Regrettably, some do not come because they do not come and they're not saved. And there are so many great saints of God who were raised in godly homes and they never really openly rebelled against the Lord. But it is still true that God seems to delight in taking brutish sinners and deeply and profoundly converting them. Such men and women bear the scars of their past life. They bring their baggage with them into God's family. But when God's work is done, those same saints of God 
They have a powerful testimony in a skeptical world. You see, this week, I ran across this wonderful sentence. God does not recruit heroes. No, he doesn't. Not many of the mighty are called. Not many of the noble are called. Not many powerful are called. Not many of the great of the world, as the world sees greatness, actually counts greatness, are really called. God doesn't go for the big names to populate heaven. God takes ordinary folks, and he does extraordinary things through them. But even that isn't the full story. When God wants to recruit someone for a frontline soldier position for his army, he goes into the enemy camp, and he rounds up a handful of the meanest, most ornery, toughest, roughest, wildest looking sinners he can find. Then he draws them to Christ, he saves them, he justifies them, converts them, sanctifies them, he cleans them up, he fixes them up, he dresses them up, and then he sends them out to do battle in the service of the King of Kings. Amen. You know who reminds me of that? My friend, Pastor Steve Upshur. He has a ministry over on Shane Street, Peacemakers International. He serves prostitutes and heroin addicts and the lowest of the low. You would call them the scum of the earth. But that's his ministry. See, Peacemakers has been there for decades. And Pastor Steve, he's now in his 70s. His son, Jeremiah, helps him in the ministry. And Steve told me a while back, he said, when I die, I want to be hugging a heroin addict. He said, because I know that would please God. See, the point Paul makes here in Romans 5, verses 6 through 9, when he says that we were powerless, that we were ungodly, that we were sinners, we were even God's enemy, all that's recorded in Romans 5, 6 through 9. Through nine. But even so, it says Christ died for us, that we might be reconciled to God. Amen. Thus does God turn his enemies into his friends, and how wonderful that is when it happens. The fourth takeaway that I want you to really grab hold of tonight before I wrap this up is no one's beyond the reach of God's grace. See, some of us, we think, eh, if you knew me, you'd understand God would never have nothing to do with me. I mean, look at Saul. He was out there throwing Christians in prison, remember? Knock, knock. Any Christians? Come with me, you're going to prison. Come with me, today's your day to die. But God, to take a man like Saul and make him into the greatest apostle who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament by the inspiration of Almighty God. Surely this is one reason Paul's story shows up three times in the New Testament. If God can save a man like Saul who turned into Paul, God can save anyone. I want to encourage some of us who are praying for friends or loved ones to come to Christ. Maybe we have children who are absolutely reprobate that need God more than you could imagine. But often we think when we're praying for people that are so far lost that our prayers just bounce off the ceiling. We pray for months, we pray for years, and we think, ah, no apparent result here. But don't despair. What we see is not the whole story. No one would have ever predicted that Paul would be converted into one of the fiercest, staunchest advocates for Jesus Christ. See, ten minutes before it happened, it all seemed impossible. Five minutes before it happened, no one would have any reason to expect anything. Ten seconds before the light broke and that voice came from heaven spoke, Paul's heart was hard as ever. But then my two favorite words, but God. Amen. So keep on praying, keep on witnessing, keep on believing. You never know what God will do. Amen. See, as we think 
about those who are far from God, as we think about those who are far from the Lord, actually, we can take this comfort. It's an irony of God's plan for salvation that the worse their rebellion, the greater will be the glory once they're saved. See, God can save the worst rebellious soul there is. The farther they are from God today, the greater will be the celebration when all those prodigal sons and all those prodigal daughters finally come home to the Father's house. It's kind of crazy. There are people that I know that I prayed for for weeks and months and years I would have thought would never connect the dots. One of those <laughs> was my spiritual son, Nicholas, who's now in glory. I would have never thought that Nicholas would gain eternity. I've told the story before, and I think it just bears repeating quickly again tonight. But Nicholas came, third row back, center seat, on this side of the church. He sat there, and after church, he came up to me and he said, I don't know why I'm here. I'm an atheist. And I told him, you can't be an atheist because it takes faith to believe nothing. <laughs> so we had a good conversation, and that developed into a relationship. I convinced him to come back. I convinced him that he should come back. Nicholas had a lot of life issues, but Nicholas was you know, extremely talented, extremely smart, just one of those standout kind of guys. But I'll tell you a part of the story of Nicholas that you might not know. I've told it a few times. You might know it. Maybe you don't. But I'm going to say it to you anyways. Whether you know it or not. You know, Nicholas died at the age of 28 from a massive heart attack. I found Nicholas the morning that he died. And I found him in his bed. He told me he would never trust anybody with a key to his house except me. And he said, don't use it unless there's an emergency. <laughs> and I had never used it. But I had texted him a couple times the night before and he didn't respond. So I thought, this is strange. Something's wrong. So the next morning before I came to church, I decided to drive out to Troy and see and check on him, which I did. And I put the key in the door and his words resonated in my mind. Don't use this key unless it's an emergency. And I said, well, the fact that he didn't respond to my text message doesn't really constitute an emergency. I said, you knew he had heart problems. You should have called the hospital. So I called Beaumont Hospital because that's where he usually went for, for medical stuff. They didn't have a patient by his name. So I put the key in the door and I opened it and went to his bedroom. And there he was laying in bed, stone cold dead. And my heart was broken. To this day, uh, it's emotional for me because yeah. over the course of a few years, we just became close friends. And I knew in my heart and I knew in my mind that Nicholas had come to a saving knowledge of, of Jesus. But I really didn't understand how much I meant to Nicholas until one day he was in the ambulance on his way to the hospital and he was using his cell phone to call me and he said, hurry up and meet me at the hospital. He said, I don't want to die alone. And I said, well, you're not going to die alone. There's people at the hospital, but I'll come. And when I got to the emergency room, they were working on him, and a, a, a lady came with this little cart with a laptop computer on it. She was trying to find his name and identifying information. He was still conscious. And asked him his name, and she said, well, you don't have an emergency contact. Who's your emergency contact? And without missing a beat, Nicholas said, that guy standing there, that's my dad. Put him down as my emergency contact. And it was at that point I realized how much I meant to him. He called me his dad. Yeah. I wasn't his dad. Yeah. I was his spiritual dad, but not his dad dad. Yeah. And um, there was just too many weird coincidences with Nicholas. I'll spare you all the details, but I have a biological son named Nicholas. They have the same birthday and... I mean, it's just kind of weird. Their moms have the same birthday, too. Wow. So there's just a lot of weird coincidences. And Nicholas's mom lived in this little town in the thumb of North Branch, and that's where our farm is. Wow. But that's not the story I want to tell you tonight. After I performed Nicholas's funeral, which the undertaker at the funeral home said I couldn't do, she said, it's too emotional for you. I hope somebody else is coming to do the service. I said, no. 
there is no one else. I'll do the service. God will strengthen me. And she said, you're a mess. You know, you're too emotional. You can't do it. I said, I'll do it. But that night I got home and I was mad. I was mad at God and I said, God, this guy, he just became a believer. And I believe in my heart and I believe in my mind that he's with you. But I was mad at God and I said, that's not good enough. I said, knowing in my mind that Nicholas is in heaven and knowing in my heart that Nicholas is in heaven is not enough. And I was fussing with God and emotional and teary-eyed and upset over his passing still. And I fell asleep that night, didn't think of it again, woke up in the morning and thought, yeah, that's kind of being a jerk, telling God. <laughs> it's not enough to know in my mind and heart that he's with you. Maybe you shouldn't have put it so strongly to God. But then three days later, that was on a Tuesday, on Thursday, my phone rang at 3.30 in the morning. And a minister friend of mine called me and told me, I don't know what this means. I know you speak with God, but I only have heard God's voice probably two or three times in my life, but I heard it tonight. And my friend told me, I don't know what this means, but he said, I heard the voice of God. And he told me to tell you that Nicholas is with me and everything's okay. Amen. Confirmation of what I asked Amen. God just a couple nights before. Amen. If that isn't God, I don't know what is. Because I told God I needed to know apart from my own mind and apart from my own heart, I need to know that Nicholas was in heaven. And I fussed with God, I argued with God, I yelled at God. And God answered that prayer. And through an independent party who I never told anything, I never told anybody about my fuss with God. And then it was confirmed. So that's what I want to tell you. You know, I believe that God can answer prayers. Yeah. 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 God can answer prayers no matter how yeah. far somebody seems away from Him. God can answer prayers. I mean, Mary and Martha, Lazarus was cold, stinking dead, as I said earlier in this message. Yeah. Lazarus wasn't sitting on that slab thinking, I wish he would hurry. Yeah. I mean, that's what his sisters were thinking. Yeah. But he was stinking yeah. and not thinking. Yes. His body was decomposing. Yeah. And God spoke life into that body yes, without anything to do with him. Yes. So God can bring our prodigal children back into the kingdom. You know, you might uh, not realize this, but you know, we have grandmothers and mothers and aunties and aunts and all kind of people that pray for people all the time. Amen. We don't waste our tears and our prayers when we speak to God. Let me tell you that again. We never waste our tears and our prayers when we speak to God. Amen. When we give God the heavy burden of a prayer, I believe that God will answer it because he intends to answer our prayers sooner or later. And this is the reason we pray because Jesus is still in the life-changing business. Amen. See, Jesus has always been in the life-changing business. Some of us have just pushed him away. Yeah. Jesus still saves lives. He still converts people. He still rescues men and women who have gone very far in sin. There's no case too hopeless for the great physician. It was kind of funny. I spoke to Jan last week, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. And she was all worried. She said... You know, this might be the end, and I'm worried, I'm filled with fear. And I said, you don't need to have any fear. She said, well, I'm worried about my husband, I'm worried about this, I'm worried about that. And I said, you know what? The Bible says, he whose mind is stayed on thee, I will keep him in perfect peace, and he's the Prince of Peace. There's no need for fear. See, the words of 2 Corinthians 5.17 are still true. If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. See, no matter how far somebody might be from God, if you are in Christ, you are a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. See, this is the story of Christianity. The story of twice-born people. You're born once physically, 
And then you're born again into the kingdom of God. You're a twice-born person if you're a Christian. Think of the list. Zacchaeus, Matthew, the man with the legion of demons, the woman who was caught in adultery, Peter, Paul, Lydia, the seller of purple, Constantine, Augustine, Luther, John Newton, the slave trader. See, God can reach anyone. Billy Sunday, the ball player. Mel Trotter, who has this terrific ministry up in the Grand Rapids area for homeless people. Malcolm Mudridge, C.S. Lewis, Chuck Colson, the guy who was the chief of staff to Richard Nixon who went to prison and then started Prison Fellowship Ministry and started the Angel Tree Ministry, which gives presents to millions of children whose parents are incarcerated. The list goes on and on and on how God can use people so far from him that he can actually grab a hold of them, change them, and convert them into what he wants them to be. Amen. And let me end with the sentence that I mentioned earlier. You cannot understand Christianity without coming to true grips with the truth of real conversion. Amen. Amen. My second question was this. Have you ever been converted? Let us pray. Gracious Amen. Father, Father, I thank you for this word and I thank you for this challenging testimony of Saul who became the Apostle Paul, one of the greatest advocates of you, Lord, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, may we realize and recognize that we have to give up ourselves, that we have to surrender, that we have to wholeheartedly trust in you that we have to commit to you. Father, I know there's people that pray for other people all the time, that their hearts and their lives would totally be transformed by this gospel that we preach. This gospel has that power. This gospel has transformation in it. How do I know? I am one. I know that God took me as a wretched man and made him and made me, rather, into the man that I am today. Amen. I thank God for Jesus. Yeah, amen. And each of us who know him individually, personally, intimately, can say the same. Amen. Thank God for Jesus. Thank God. Make a choice, and you'll be saying the same thing. Thank God for Jesus. Amen? amen. God bless you all.